Hello, my name is Dean Banerjee, and this is PLL Loop Band with Design, Part 1. When we first try to design a PLL, most of us come across a bunch of intimidating equations. Wouldn't it be nice to have a video describing the process of designing your PLL loop bandwidth? Whether you're looking for the fastest lock time, good spur attenuation, or the least jitter, the next two videos will give you a good starting point for designing your PLL. Before we move on, please make sure that you've watched the previous videos on TI's Precision Labs Clock and Timing Phase Lock Loop Fundamentals series, or are able to refer back to them as needed. The performance of a PLL is determined by up to five design parameters. Loop bandwidth and phase margin are the first two. We've discussed these parameters in previous videos. Let's review them. The loop bandwidth is a frequency at which the magnitude of G sub S times H of S is equal to 1. The phase margin can be calculated as 180 degrees plus the phase of the open loop transfer function at the loop bandwidth frequency offset. The phase margin tells us how far the phase of the forward loop gain transfer function is from minus 180 degrees. Keep in mind the phase of the transfer function is a negative number in the range of minus 90 to minus 180 degrees. Choosing the loop bandwidth, designated as BW, equal to BW jit, which is the loop bandwidth which gives the minimum jitter, will give you the minimum jitter of the PLL. This is a good starting point. You can then adjust the loop bandwidth to optimize for lock time or reduce spurs. Decreasing the bandwidth to BW1 adds the red portion to the phase noise, and increasing BW to BW2 adds the blue portion of the phase noise. Higher phase margins are desirable for reducing jitter and high stability. Lower phase margins are typically used to reduce spurs, however they add ringing to the transient response. Using control loop theory and transfer functions of G of S and H of S, we can derive the closed loop transfer function of the PLL. Let's define a new variable K, the loop gain constant. K, the loop gain constant, is dependent on the charge pump gain, VCO gain, and N divider value. The forward loop transfer function, the product of G sub S and H of S, can be simplified by replacing KPD, KVCO, and N constants with the loop gain constant K. Remember the integration term S in the denominator of the forward loop gain comes from the VCO transfer function. Often, a PLO loop filter design needs to span a range of VCO frequencies instead of a constant frequency. So let's discuss how to choose the loop gain constant in this case. The goal when designing the loop filter for a range of frequencies is to minimize the loop gain variation. Changes to the loop gain because of different end divider settings or VCO gain varying across frequency can be countered by increasing the charge pump gain. It is okay for the VCO gain, charge pump gain, or end counter value to change as long as the total loop gain remains fairly constant. In order to minimize how much the actual loop gain varies from the value that was used to design the loop filter, choose the loop gain constant to be the geometric mean of the minimum and maximum values. Here's an example where the design tries to hit all frequencies in the range of 1500 to 2000 MHz. The charge pump current is programmed to different values to compensate for variations of the end divider and VCO gain. Consequently, the loop gain constant stays within 2% range across the frequency span. After the filter is designed, according to the K design parameter, a good best practice would be to simulate the loop filter at the minimum and maximum frequencies before implementing it in hardware. We've discussed the transfer function of almost all the blocks of the PLL. Let's take a closer look at the transfer function of the loop filter. For simplicity, let's start with a transfer function of a second order loop filter that consists of a capacitor to ground and a capacitor and a resistor in series to ground, C2 and R2. The transfer function, Z sub S, of a second order loop filter is illustrated here. Here you see the zero on the top, which is R2 and C2, and then you see also there's a 
pole at zero and an additional pole as well formed by C1, C2, and R2. You can calculate the transfer function of a third and fourth order loop filter as well, and you will see that you can generalize and simplify the transfer function to the following equation. For the second order loop filter, a3 equals 0, a2 equals 0, a1 equals c1 times c2 times r2, and a0 equals c1 plus c2. The table shows what values these constants take for third and fourth order loop filter. You can try to calculate the transfer function of a third order loop filter and see if it matches the table. Don't worry, you'll probably never write out these equations, especially after we learn how to simulate PLL loop filters in the next training video. The generalized loop filter transfer function we discussed can also be written in terms of poles and zeros. Here t2 is a zero of the transfer function and 1 over t1, 1 over t3, and 1 over t4 are the poles. The gain versus frequency offset graph illustrates how the gain of the open loop transfer function changes with the loop filter order. The blue line shows the gain of the second order loop filter, the purple line shows the gain of the third order loop filter, and the red line shows the gain of the fourth order loop filter. The second order loop filter has one pole, which is 1 over t1, the third order loop filter has two, 1 over t1 and 1 over t3, and the fourth order loop filter has three poles, 1 over t1, 1 over t3, and 1 over t4. When t3 and t4 are equal to zero, the poles move to infinity and the equation of the denominator in the equation of loop filter transfer function is reduced in terms. For example, if t3 equals zero, then one plus st3 equals one. Let's take a closer look at the fourth order loop filter transfer function as an example. The zero of the transfer function t2 is the same for all filters and is independent of the loop filter order, and it is equal to R2 times C2. The zero is necessary for stability of the PLL. The location of the poles and zeros of the loop filter dictate the shape and gain of the open loop transfer function, G of S. At each of the poles of the loop gain slope will start to roll off by an additional 20 dB in a decade. The lower the gain at a particular frequency offset, the lower the spurs will be at, on the output. Basic knowledge of spurious noise in PLLs will be helpful for your understanding part two of this video training on loop bandwidth design. There will be a link included at the end of this video if you need to go back for a quick reminder of the key parameters for PLLs. In reality, if the roll off is 40 dB per decade after the first pole, one over T1, the roll off will not be exactly 60 dB after the second pole, 1 over t3, because the Bode plot will not have a corner at 1 over t feet, but rather a more natural curve. When designing your loop filter, it is important to pay attention to the highest order capacitor. The highest order capacitor is a capacitor that adds in parallel with the VCO input capacitance, CVCO. The VCO input capacitance is a capacitor to ground right at the input of the VCO. In a fourth order loop filter, C4 is the highest order capacitor. The minimum value needed for the highest order capacitor needs to make sure that the VCO input capacitance, CVCO, does not, not dominate this value. What would be the highest order capacitor for a second order loop filter? If you pick C1, you are correct. Remember, the highest order capacitor must be in parallel with the VCO input capacitance. Another important thing to note is that some clocking devices integrate some or all the components of the loop filter within the chip. It's always good practice to try to save some extra space on your PCB. The gray box depicts an example of a clocking device with a partially integrated loop filter and an integrated VCO. The red box depicts the components that must be added to complete the loop while designing your schematic. When designing on your board, you'll need to pay attention to avoid accidentally building an incorrect or unstable loop filter. Integrated loop filter components should not be part of your schematic. On this device, R3, C3, R4, and C4 are integrated in the device. Thanks for watching this video on PLL loop bandwidth design. 
Please take a few minutes to test your understanding of the concepts presented in this video by taking the short quiz. Don't forget to watch the next video in our series, PLL Loop Bandwidth Design Part 2, to learn about how to choose between different loop filters and attenuating spurs. If you need more information on our clock and timing products, visit ti.com backslash clocks.